This meeting is being recorded. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's session. I would like to introduce today's first speaker, Dr. P. N. Maya, who is going to talk about the uh, role, uh, role of atomic simulations in plasma material, uh, materials, interaction for nuclear fusion research. We are lucky to have her today. Uh, she did her PhD from Institute in the interaction of plasma with materials relevant for nuclear fusion device. She did her postdoc in atomistic simulations of plasma material interaction from Max Planck, Insti uh, from Max Planck Institute for Plasma Physics, Germany. Later, she worked on IAEA project, uh, International Atomic Energy Agency in ITER India on experiments and modeling of iron and neutron irradiation. Then she worked on plasma thruster development under a EU Horizon 2020 research grant in Germany. Currently, she is working on the design of fusion power reactors. So thank you so much, ma'am, to be here with us today. And we would like to hear from you. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Krishna, uh, for the introduction. And I would like to thank Gurudath also for giving me this opportunity to talk about our work. As Krishna said, today I'll be speaking about the role of atomistic simulations in plasma material interactions in nuclear fusion research. So uh, in this talk, I shall try to show you from uh, how can you use atomistic simulations in real life environment in predicting material properties in predicting uh, the design of material uh, materials relevant for projects such as nuclear fusion where you have the materials will undergo extremely high conditions of heat neutron loads that's the highly reactive environment and how can you use atomistic simulations spe especially molecular dynamics to predict and to understand the properties of materials. So the background, I shall just give you a quick background of why we do it, because uh, fusion is a source of energy. As we all know, it is an abundant and clean source of energy, where what happens is that one has deuterium and tritium, which are the isotopes of hydrogen, which fuse together to produce and energy in the form of neutrons and alpha particles. So as we know, if you want to fuse two particles together, you have to uh, get them to very high energy in order to overcome the electrostatic repulsion. And we would like to keep them in the low particle, low mass number particle. If you look at the binding energy per nucleon curve, we know that it is easy to fuse particles which have smaller atomic number. So we ch choose hydrogen. And the highest cross-section is for hydrogen, deuterium and tritium isotope of hydrogen. So in order to fuse them, what we do is we have to take them to very high temperature such that the electrons are stripped off and they get enough kinetic energy to overcome the electrostatic repulsion between them. When uh, two such deuterium, tritium nuclei are fused, we get energy in the form of helium, 3.5 MeV, which is a helium nuclei that is two protons and two neutrons and a new, uh, and a single neutron with 14.1 MeV energy. Now, if you look at how this whole thing is done, there are, of course, various ways to do it. One of the ways to do it is use magnetic confinement, where one uses magnetic fields to keep or to hold the hydrogen isotope. The other way is, of course, gravitational confinement. As we know, in the case of stars, including sun, the energy is produced by the fusion reaction where the charged particles, the deuterium, the hydrogen isotopes, hydrogen and higher uh, elements are held together by gravity. Here we have more magnetic field because we don't have the benefit of the gravity, such high, strong gravity here on earth. So how we do it, I, I'll just show you a quick video of how this is done. Uh, it's taken from what called International Thermonuclear Experiment, ITER, which is being built in France. And this is a, uh, sketch video of how that machine is going to be envisaged. So it's a real um, size measurement. So what you see here is what called a cryostat. You can imagine this is like a flask, thermos flask, inside which you keep the temperature cold and outside it's room temperature. So it's like a huge thermos flask of made of stainless steel, which has a height of 30 meter. That's like a 10 story building with a lot of holes in it. And these holes have to be thermally sealed. So what you see here is the cryostat, which is what they call as a thermos flask, I said. So this has roughly 30 meter height. That's like you can imagine a 10 story building. 
with a lot of holes in it. And these holes has to be thermally sealed to keep the things inside, which is at cold temperature. That means much below the room temperature. And if you open the machine, this is how you look like. This is how the cross-section of a tokamak would look like. This is a, you can imagine this is like a toroid, which is in the shape of a donut or more locally the meduvada. So you cut this and then what you see here is the half cross-section, the cross-section of that donut, which is what a toroid. So inside which you see that particle, starch particle, deuterium and tritium, which are shown in green and red color, are circulating in the, uh, they are heated to very high temperature and there is a magnetic field which keeps the particles to stay there. When you heat this gas to a very high temperature, it gets to, you strip the electrons and ions and it reaches a state, what is called plasma, where you have uh, active, strong uh, interaction of the charged particles. And uh, these particles are confined by the magnetic field. At the same time, they have very high kinetic energy, therefore they keep moving. And that's what you see here, they are kind of confined. Now, uh, when you look here, you see that there are these, these charged particles are confined in a vessel, which is made of stainless steel. And the, uh, the region which is very close to the plasma, you see that the plasma is touching the vessel walls here. These are made uh, of materials which has very high tolerance of temperature and also very high melting point and also has very low, uh, what one calls as a erosion yield, which means you cannot easily remove the particle by the hydrogen ions from the wall. That's exactly one of the problem that we look at in the session, how we can understand this and how can we use atomistic simulation to understand the interaction of this plasma, hydrogen deuterium plasma with the walls of this thing. The other thing is when you heat them to very high temperature, let's go. So this is the vessel cross section. And if you really heat them very high temperature, so uh, let's see this. So you are supplying energy, but you see here in the form of blue light coming out is basically you are putting particles with very high energy. So you're supplying heat, energy is, can be converted to heat. So you see the hot particles are getting circulated in the vessel as the red color indicates extremely hot particles. And if you keep them sufficiently long, they have chance collisions between them. So it's called a thermonuclear fusion because you're not really bombarding a solid deuterium with a solid tritium or a solid tritium with a beam of deuterium. Instead, we are keeping them in the vessel for long enough. So you could imagine it's like a gas, a rarefied gas you are keeping. Of course, the interaction between the gas particles are different compared to plasma. But nevertheless, you can imagine this is a rare, rarefied gas, a low dense gas is kept in a vessel and they have chance collisions between them. And these chance collisions can lead to nuclear fusion reaction. That's what, that's why it's called thermonuclear. And you see that uh, the hot spot, which is basically shown here with yellow colors, that's the uh, point where you have huge fusion reaction happening. And because of this, you get to produce the neutrons and the alpha particles as we saw here. Can you see the PPT back now? Is PPT visible to you? Is the screen visible to you now? Yes, we are back to the slide. Yeah, okay, thank you. So now, uh, one thing you have to keep in mind that the temperature is very high. That's 10 to 20 keV. You know that temperature, uh, energy, temperature can be expressed in energy unit because it's kT. So you can show express temperature in 20 keV means that's like, uh, that like million degrees centigrade of temperature. That's very high temperature. And the density is 10 to the power 19 ions per cubic meter. That's roughly six orders of magnitude, smaller than what you call, what you see in the atmosphere. So it's a very less dense, but very high temperature stuff that you have inside. If you take a picture of this, this is how this would look like. You don't see the plasma inside because it doesn't radiate any kind of light. So what you can see here is the pink color thing is the radiation where the plasma is in touch with the material walls and materials cannot be taken to very high temperature. They have a melting point. So for example, tungsten, if you take, it has a highest melting point of, uh, it has one of the highest melting point, roughly 3,400 C. So you can't really take the material to very high temperature. And you want to keep the material somewhere around 1,000, 1,200 Kelvin. That's the normal operating temperature of the material. And you have very high density, high temperature plasma interacting with the wall. So uh, the challenges here are 
basically uh, the challenges in nuclear fusion therefore include one of the biggest challenges to how to hold these particles, how to minimize this interaction. However, we cannot get rid of the interaction and the particles which coming from the plasma to the wall, which you see here, the material structure, you can imagine this is continuous all over its field, okay, are deuterium tritium ions, you have of course electrons, electrons are the conductor of electricity as well as heat, then you have alpha particles, which is the helium nuclei formed out of fusion, you have neutrons and what you call an impurity ion, which is basically one of the things we will see in the simulations, an ion from the plasma can go to the wall and release an ion from the wall. So if you have a hydrogen ion or deuterium ion from the plasma goes to, let's say that the wall is made of carbon, then a hydrogen from the plasma can hit the wall and take out a carbon atom from the wall. And this process is what you call erosion, sputtering, and various other names you see as you read some of the material science literature. So this process release a carbon atom into the plasma. And this is what you call an impurity ion. You also want to put additional ways of impurities into the plasma to radiate away the heat at the edge. This is another challenging issue, but those also create impurity ions in the plasma. So collectively, all these processes, that is the interaction of the plasma, which is uh, at extremely high temperature and density and moderate densities to the wall and the the processes that is happening back and forth is collectively called fusion plasma wall interactions. Now, if you look at the material perspective, what do you see? You have extremely high heat load, as I showed you that the temperatures are very high and you have extremely large number of particles falling on the material and you have neutrons. So the material in such situation, which is called the materials under extreme situation, something which you see also in space physics or re nuclear reactor studies and so on, or any high end materials science studies, what you see is materials have to undergo a uh, consecutive load of hot, part, heat load, particle load, and the neutron load. And all the co interaction of these, these together form the overall picture. And there could be some competing effect, some can bring synergy, that is, one will be bad and one will be good. Overall, it can be good or bad. So there are synergistic effects which can play a great role. And if you look at the uh, real life, what does that mean to the material? So if you look at the heat load, this is like 10 to 20 megawatt per meter square, which is one of the highest in the world, in the universe, in terms of on earth. In space, you will find more, more heat load. And the other thing is the plasma load, which is ions, electrons, and radiation, and of course, neutrons. So what do they do to the material? If you have very high heat falling on the material, the first thing you would think that it can undergo melting if the heat is very high. Other thing is, if the heat is moderate, it can go a phase transformation. Like for example, if you have a material which is in a body-centered cubic, it can go a phase transformation to a phase-centered cubic. Melting is a phase transformation which happens in a first-order phase transition where you have a different class of um, process. And you can also have second-order phase transitions, which can also change the mechanical and thermal property. For example, if you want to keep a material which has a very high thermal conductivity, but because of the phase transformation, it could go to a low thermal, thermally, low thermally conducting state. That is not good for your um, design. Similarly, plasma load. As I told, the plasma ions can take ions from the wall, replace the ions from the wall, which is called erosion. It can create impurity. Also, it can have uh, issues related to radioactivity because as you know, tritium is a radioactive isotope of hydrogen, which is not naturally occurring. It is, uh, it has a very short half-life. However, tritium, uh, we have to get tritium into the plasma to form the plasma, uh, to have a higher cross-section and the tritium can stay in the material, it can create radioactivity. Then in the case of neutron, you will create defect. You can have transmutations because neutron can, the materials can capture neutron and leave, uh, give a new material, which can also cause gamma radiations. And there could be one, another important point is embrittlement, that is hydrogen in the material can create, can cause crack in the material, which is not a very good thing in the nuclear environment from the safety viewpoint. And you will see in, when you look at the nuclear reactor designs, you'll see that the hydrogen embrittlement is one of the major problem in uh, reactor design and uh, safety issues. So that is the overall picture I want to tell you. Now, if you want to address such a problem, it looks very complex on the first phase of it. But fortunately, we can reduce the problem into very simple elements and we can look at specific one. 
before I go on to that, that is where the modeling comes into play. I just want to give you a view. What kind of materials would you look? You want to have materials with very high melting point such that high temperature can be stay, uh, withstand. You, can, you want something which low erosion yield because you could keep the material for a long time. If you remove the material by erosion fast, you have to replace them. That means you cannot run the machine for a long time. Then you want to have materials with high radiation tolerance. You don't want the material, uh, if the neutron falls on them, if they lose its material property, if it has become very soft or if it goes, uh, if create cracks very easily, then the material is not very good. And you don't want the storage of hydrogen, therefore you want to have low affinity towards hydrogen. So these are the general conditions one keep in mind. So those who might be interested in, this is an active area of material research in itself in addition to the plasma physics point. There's a lot of engineering of material and fundamental material science and material engineering comes into play. The uh, choice of material as of now, which is still an open area and it requires more insights and more uh, studies are needed in this area. But nevertheless, overall agreement is for two class of material. Either you want to go for a low atomic number such as carbon, beryllium, lithium, boron, et cetera, where you have uh, you could have high erosion, but you have certain advantage in terms of the radiation, or you want to go for very high Z material like tungsten, which has very high melting point. By the way, carbon is extremely interesting because carbon has no melt layer. So high temperature, it just blime to carbon directly from solid to gaseous phase. So uh, these are the active areas of research where one can um, contribute to. So. Now, I just want to tell you, uh, having all that complex system, how do we actually approach the problem? So uh, one of the important point is, I told you, we have different particles interacting together. So if, if we look at the erosion problem, that is one uh, major concern in terms of the lifetime of the machine. So we have uh, two different type of particles. If you really look into the particle picture here, if you just go back to this uh, here, we have ions, we have electrons, and we have radiation. Radiation is always good because it takes away some of the plasma energy in the form of light, but we have ions and electrons. And in terms of the momentum transfer, or in terms of the uh, chance that an electron, uh, an ion can, uh, the, a particle can take a, or a remove another particle from the wall, because the ions are much heavier than the electrons, ions contribute mostly to the erosion process. So ion electron have roughly 2000 difference in the mass, right? Now, the energy is another player here. So we can think that erosion is predominantly happening from the ions, and we have energetic ions, and we have hydrogen plasma. Energetic means the ion energy could be as high as several kilo electron volt, and hydrogen plasma could, have it, uh, could be very low towards the edge, the temperature could be very low. So there could be synergistic effect or a mutually uh, opposite effect. So the question you want to ask, therefore, is how can this influence your wall? Does it cause too much erosion or does it cause too little erosion or is it beneficial for you or not? That is the question. And we know that tokamak is a too complex system to isolate such process. So if you look in the tokamak, so we have to reduce the complexity of the system to simpler levels to address the physics. So we don't do the experiments in tokamak. We look at the, uh, instead, what we do is we do lab experiments where you have well-defined system. For example, if you want to study the energetic and the thermal plasma interaction, you can uh, do with very precise beams and low temperature plasmas, which have very low energy. So one of the thing is to use ion beams, which will be well-defined energy, well-defined particle flux. So we have much more control over our lab experiments. So we, we, another thing is hydrogen has a peculiar property. You heard in the chemistry lecture also that hydrogen is something which is chemically active and chemically interacting with the, uh, any material. And also it can, it can impact momentum or physical processes such as collisional process. So we want to decouple these two effects. We want to give hydrogen only to the chemical effect. We want to decouple the chemical and the energetic process, particle process. Therefore, we use, instead of hydrogen beam, one can go to argon beam. Argon, you know, it is an inert material and it doesn't have any chemical effect, but it can impart momentum. It's heavier than hydrogen. So we tune the total momentum you tune uh, with the mass ratio, one by 40. So hydrogen has a mass of one and here um, argon has a mass of 40. So you tune the total momentum from the uh, with the mass ratio so that you can tune the energy of the ion. You can work with a low energy ion, which can impart the same momentum. 
has a high energy hydrogen. You can find that. Another thing is your flux. Uh, hydrogen to argon ratio, we can vary. So because in a tokamak, you don't have that many high energy, very high energy ions compared to the thermal ions. So we can vary that by varying the hydrogen to argon ratio. Now you have a precise control in your experiments. And if you want to understand, so of course the model, uh, the lab experiment does give you some result, but what does it mean? How do we understand? There we use molecular dynamic simulation. There is no other way other than molecular dynamics or it is the best tool to understand such processes. But the challenge in molecular dynamics is how do you create a system, a stable system which is mimicking experiments or at least close to reality? As you heard yesterday that uh, the simulation time or the simulate the ability to simulate propose is goes, explodes as you increase the number of particles. And we saw yesterday also in Murillo's talk that uh, there are uh, we, what we call as a potential cutoff, which will reduce the number of particles you can simulate at the same time. And this is what you call as a neighbor list in the problem, right? We heard that yesterday. So you can you have ways to uh, simulate, uh, let's say, so we, we want to simulate a fewer number of particles, which is still can be done in a computer, but at the same time, you get a realistic system, a realistic output. So therefore mimicking or creating a stable system is one of the challenge in MD. And that's one of the most important thing one must take in, into account when one does any of the system, any of them, especially materials. So uh, I just want to show you how we approach such a problem. So the experiments in the lab, if we do an argon beam and hydrogen atoms, both together, uh, we see that on the left-hand side, what you see here, here in the x-axis, what you see is the ion energy, which goes from one to hundred, several hundreds of EV. And on the y-axis, we are showing the erosion yield. So if I say an erosion yield of one means, an argon atom can uh, replace a carbon atom from the wall. So if it is more than one means, an argon can create more than one carbon taking out of the wall. That is the erosion yield means. So how many number of particles coming out of the wall compared to the incident number of incident particles? Now, if you look at the blue points here, what you see here is the, uh, when you bombard with argon and hydrogen together, the erosion yields are much higher than one. If you just bombard the, just with the argon that you see in the red color curve, red data points, this one. If you look here, then the number of, uh, then the erosion yield is much smaller than one. So you get a huge margin here when you go from pure argon to argon plus hydrogen. And if you just do the hydrogen, you get much lower yield, which is the line which you see here. So we know that in the lab, from the lab experiments, we were able to show that there could be a, an enhanced erosion because of the synergistic effect. And if you look at the right hand side, this is the existing model at the time, which showed that the sputtering or the erosion, the same word is used for the both, the sputtering yield or the erosion yield is much smaller. You look at the number here, it is like 10 to the power minus two order of 0 0.01. That means every 100 atom will give you one carbon out. Whereas if you look here, every one experiment shows you that every atom will give you more than one. So there is obviously a two order of magnitude discrepancy. So how do we understand what happens when you bombard simultaneously? This was the problem that we were attempting. So the approach therefore that we take, we don't really go to a very high energy ion because we are limited by the simulation uh, facility that we cannot, if you want to simulate, let's say one MeV ion, or 100 kV, you need to have much bigger facility. Therefore, we want to still show that the process is valid. Therefore, we can still go for a low energy ion and a low energy hydrogen atom. And we have carbon with some hydrogen, so we can make a hydrocarbon film as the substrate. And we bombard with argon atoms. So as I told, this will not have any chemical effect. Now comes the important assumptions in MD simulations. One of the important point is, uh, if although when you look at the uh, whole overall plasma wall interaction, you saw that they're all moving together randomly in a fast pace, everything is very chaotic. But if you really look in the time scale, the whole problem in physics, not only in MD, in physics generally depends on the time and space scale that you look at. If you look at the atomistic interaction, they are happening in femtosecond to picosecond time scale. Therefore, uh, I want to argue to you that MD is the best tool to simulate such process. 
one of the consideration comes from this particular thing that the atomistic interaction happens at max in picosecond time scale. Therefore, if you want to simulate such fast processes, the particles which are involved, the atoms that are moving in a picosecond time scale are not so large. So if you want to understand the basic, you can still take a fewer number of particles and can simulate in a shorter time scale. And another thing is, when, although we said that we have a simultaneous interaction of argon and hydrogen, however, if you look at the time scale of bombardment, so if you say that we have an argon flux of 10 to the power, let's say 16 per meter square or 10 to the power 12 per centimeter square, that means 10 to the power 12 atoms falling on one centimeter square area. Now, if you look at this in a nanometer or in an angstrom, you have almost 100th of a particle falling. And so every angstrom will, every 100 nanometer will receive, 100 square nanometer will receive one particle. So, uh, the, sorry, every 100 square angstrom would receive one nanometer, one particle. Therefore, we can see that these simulations are not happening at a same time and at the same scale if you look in the if you zoom into the atomistic level therefore one can say they are not simultaneous bombardment instead they are sequential or intermittent so you have one argon falling then there are several hydrogen falling then another argon falling so depending on the flux that is the num how many number of particles falling on your surface and how fast what is the energy depending on that one can see that such a problem can be attempted with molecular dynamics or atomistic pictures that is why we chose that we could do molecular dynamics simulation. Now you heard a study over the two talks that molecular dynamics is nothing but solving the equation of motion of atoms exactly in an interactive potential. So you get the exact positions and velocities of the particles. It's a deterministic method. You start solving the equation of motion for a large number of particles in a common interactive potential. Now the whole thing which is critical here is the potential. If your potential is not very correct, you can get different properties. So the potential, this is one of the important area of research in the MD, that is to develop potentials which can simulate real physical systems as close to reality. Uh, that I'm not going to cover in this talk, but it is an interesting area. If anyone interested, you can contact us. Now, the uh, one of the potential which we used is called brenner beardmore potential, which is a many body potential, which is specifically for hydrocarbon interactions. That means you can take into account hydrocarbon means, you know, it has different hybridization state, like you, the carbon atom could be having sp3, which means it is bonded with two, four different neighbors, or it could be sp2, which has means the way the electron sharing happens will give you something we commonly call a double bond, or it can be an sp configuration. So this potential has a capability to take into account to a great extent the hybridization state. This is an important point in atomistic simulations. And argon, 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 you know, this is a uh, inert gas or inert atom. Therefore, uh, you don't need to have a chemical effect. You don't need to look into the hybridization state or how the bonding varies, how the uh, orbitals are, th those do not matter. Therefore, we use the Lennard Jones potential. You had a, uh, in the first talk you heard yesterday, this kind of potentials where you have what you also popularly known as 612 potential. So there is a repulsion and an attractive part. And one of the way to solve these equations of motion, there are various ways we use predictor character, but one can of course use other methods as well. And the important thing to notice is that the time scale of simulations was from a femtosecond, that is 10 to the power 15, minus 15 second to 10 to the power minus nine, that's a nanosecond. So we, this is the time scale in conventional MD simulations, you, you have to keep the time scale like that. But of course, there are ways one can go accelerated method and do simulations at higher time scale uh, by increasing the temperature because it's a Boltzmannian process, which I do not discuss right now, but I'll show you a glimpse of how that might help. So now if you go to simulations, there are two things. First, the most important thing is to prepare the sample. And second part is the bombardment simulations. So in the sample preparation, which is the key aspect of molecular simulations is that uh, where one need to make a sample, which is basically simulating the real, close to real experimental samples. So how do we do that? We wanted to make an amorphous hydrocarbon film because we have a carbon wall, which is interacting with large number of hydrogen and uh, eventually that become a little amorphous hydrocarbon film. 
So how do we do that? We take a random collection of thousand atoms. Now this number sounds very small, but I'll show you how this real it is, how close to reality we can mimic. So let us say we take a random collection of thousand atoms. We take the most uh, initial guess would be, let's take 50% hydrogen, 50% carbon. It may not be the final configuration, but let's start with that. And we want to have a 15 nanometer, uh, sorry, 14 uh, angstrom by 14 angstrom by 2.8, 28 angstrom. It's a small, tiny simulation cell. And we start with a periodic boundary condition. Now I'll show you uh, how this simulation is done in a, what are the steps in the sample preparation in a second. Now I want you to note one thing is a random collection. This particular word, random collection means you, uh, you know, in a lattice, in a clear, in a crystalline lattice, you have a nothing random. Everything is pre-described. You know the bond length. You know the bond angle. Even in the case of a molecule, you know nothing is random because molecule has specific bond angles and bond length. So uh, what happens is that you. Uh, have to create, but if you want to create an amorphous material, you have to create an amorphous film from a collection of particles which are randomly chosen. Now, uh, random means uh, in numerical simulation, you have ways to create random numbers. And this is something you could look at if you use any of the software, MATLAB, Python, any of the software, you get the command RAND, which will give you, or GRAND, or in Fortran, which will give you a random uh, number generator. But how to create random number is something you could look at. This is something, a very interesting problem. And there are, uh, you have to first of all show that your random number follows the thermodynamic, uh, the statistical properties like center limit theorem and so on. So this is a thing which one must spend time on when you do the molecular dynamic simulation. So random number generation is an important aspect of any atomistic simulation. And also other simulations like Monte Carlo, which also heavily relies on the random number. So the quality of the random number generation a lot depends on your, uh, uh, dep uh, I mean, qual quality of the random number generation depends a lot on your material property, final material structure you get, or the final process you get. It doesn't matter even if it is material. And you also probably know there are no true random number generators. They are called pseudo random number because you follow a sequence. And uh, true random number generators are like radioactive decay, or maybe the thoughts that comes to your mind is a true random, random process, right? You have any random thought, which is not pre-described, or a radioactive decay, which is a truly random process. But the computer generated random numbers are pseudo random numbers, and one must spend some time to understand this when one does a simulation. Uh, so it's an important point that you could look at. Uh, and the Second part is once you create a sample, you do the bombardment simulations. Now I said another word is periodic boundary in X and Y, X, Y, and Z. Uh, you already heard what periodic boundary is. It means you have small units of the sample which are repeating, uh, units, unit size which is repeating in X, Y, and Z direction so that you get the feeling of an infinitely large system with a periodic length of, it's like a lattice. A lattice has a periodic length of your unit cell, but it is infinitely many in all directions. Similarly, you can imagine a simulation box periodic in XYZ means you have a uh, periodic length of, let's say here in this case, 14 nanometer, oh, oh, sorry, one, 14 angstrom in X and Y, and 28 nanometer in, uh, 28 angstrom in the Z direction, and it repeats all over the space. So if we look at the sample preparation step, this was, Again, in material simulations, the sample preparation plays a key role. So uh, if you look at the sample preparation step, this is how your unit cell would look like. You have a 14 angstrom X direction, 14 angstrom Y direction, and 28 angstrom Z direction collection of random collection of carbon and hydrogen with 50-50. They are not bonded to each other. They are completely random. They can freely move. Now what you do is you create the sample at zero degree. You raise to 300 Kelvin by using something called a temperature control, uh, which you heard of various thermostats yesterday. So you can raise the temperature from zero to 300 Kelvin. Then you raise the temperature to 4,000 Kelvin. So this is an accelerated process where you raise the temperature of the system to very high such that, because we know in a, uh, what we want to do is we want to create uh, a lattice with chemically bonded carbon and hydrogen atoms. So if you look at the potential, let's say this is your X and Y direction. So you have a potential which goes like this, let's say. Uh, now, this is the potential minima. And what happens is that you want the atoms to be bonded here. So, but there could be particles which are in local minimas. 
maybe the real system might have minima which one goes like this and there may be little local minima so you want to take out those particles which are in the local minima to finally to the global minima so that means really to the chemical bonding so this may be the, your bond energy this corresponds to your this is the potential energy axis here b and this is the distance between the particle you go like this then you want to take the particle to their local minima uh, global minima not to their local minima that is why you need to go to very high temperature because it's an array boltzmannian process and its probability goes as e to the power minus e by k it's very hard to write with this so it goes as e to the power minus e by kt where e is this little tiny energy bands energy depth you see so higher the temperature means you take them all this is taken out to the larger minima that's why we go from 300 kelvin to 4000 kelvin you want to really make a stable system which is at the potential minima now you do this process for uh, this is done for 50 nanosecond first you heat then you cool down at a fast rate so that they are quickly falling into their minima so this process is done several times uh, until you uh, uh, further increase in the uh, temperature or further cycles do not really change the system globally that means the potential energy of the system do not change we keep tracking the potential energy at each step and in the tutorial you will see that how the potential energy can be tracked so the energy uh, so the temperature goes from 4000 to 3000 kelvin you quench it back the process is called quenching in normal terms and then you repeat this cycle once the system is stable this is periodic in x y z direction so you can imagine another box of this sitting here and sitting to the left top right front back everything so after this many cycles you remove the top and bottom boundary so now it is periodic in the xy but free in the z direction why do we do that we wanted to have a surface which is in receiving the particles so therefore in order to create the surface we remove the top and bottom part that means you say that this is no longer periodic in x and y but only uh, no longer periodic in z but only in x and y then you relax this again for a while so when you remove the surface means what you have half plane of atoms missing above half plane of atoms missing below now if you remove this what you see here is a system which is like this which has uh, and another thing we do is we fix the bottom layer fix means the atoms in the last layer cannot move why we do that because if you hit a particle from the top let's say you are bombarding somebody from here then uh, this will impart a momentum to the lattice so to the momentum conservation it can also it would require that the particle will have to move slightly below so to avoid that we don't want the simulation cell as such drifting therefore we fix the bottom layer here and we do uh, we keep the temperature inside is we wanted to maintain the temperature at 300 kelvin in the core when there is no bombardment but we want uh, a system which is more like in contact with surroundings you know we heard yesterday about the um, ensembles where we know that ensemble is there are various type of ensemble so one thing we want to do is the surrounding temperature of the system is not changing only when the region where the radiation or the bombardment happen goes to a higher temperature so therefore we want to keep the bulk of the system which is like a three angstrom layer in the bottom we keep, we do a temperature scaling what you call a thermostat where the velocities are scaled according to thermodynamic uh, problem thermodynamic considerations or the statistical considerations and uh, you keep the temperature in the this region the cn region you see where there is no temperature scaling so the you just bombard the any material here whatever temperature this region will rise to it will have that temperature and you relax it for a longer time such that this temperature goes back to your prescribed 300 k which is where you want to keep the samples initially at and the layer the, the size of the simulation cell has to be much larger than your region of interest what i call a region of interest is where there is some effects happening for example you bombard then you see something happening there and so on so in the case of our simulations the one which i say here right now has Uh, something like uh, one um something like 6 7 angstrom was the region of interest so something there let's say up to here and you have much more than that is kept so that there is no fast moving particle enter the region of thermostat this is important then what we also did was because it's a loosely surface when you open uh, surface is kind of loosely 
bound with a lot of roughness. So to even out the roughness, you just bombard, just like you do in reality, you bombard with some argon, sputter, argon beam so that the surface layers are removed. Similarly, we bombard with 5 EV argon just to remove some of the unwanted uh, loosely bound atoms on the surface. Now here, you have to keep in mind that this is a finite system size with a periodic length of 14 angstrom, but one needs one also do simulations or when we do the simulations, we will change the system size to various to see there are any effect of finite effect, finite system effect, which you also heard yesterday that finite system effects could be important. So this is something you have to make sure as well. Now, how you validate the sample after the irradiation, after the sample making, you do the what you call the pair correlation function carbon-carbon pair correlation function, which means it gives you the probability. So if you take a carbon atom in a lattice and you look, you ask the question, at what distance do I find my neighbor? That is what the pair correlation tells you. So if you look at this thing here in the left-hand side, the G of R, which can be calculated with this function, which is, this is the delta function or R, R, R minus Rij. So a given particle at a position R summarize over all other particles and you do the averaging and that's what gives you the pair correlation function. Now, if you do this function, this thing on your particles, you see that the particle-particle pair correlation would look like this, this way. So at 1.5 angstrom, you have the first particle. This is what you expect in a carbon system. And then you have a second order peak, which is coming here, which is around uh, because of the uh, diagonal carbon atom. So this is the nearest neighbor or carbon might be forming a ring-like structure. So this one is the 1.5 and the next one, this distance is the second peak and so on, you will get. We did the amorphous carbon from the experimental simulation. We compared with the amorphous carbon films with neuron scattering experiments in experimental simulation, and you see the same thing. So uh, we can say that our samples are reasonably okay, our densities are okay, uh, and so on, temperate, so on. Now you bombard this one with uh, 150 EV hydrogen ion, uh, sorry, 150 EV argon ion and 0.5 EV hydrogen. We, what we do is we do multiple bombardments. So each bombardment will followed by one picosecond simulation time, followed by a four picosecond relaxation so that the temperature is really brought back to 300 Kelvin. Then we bombard hydrogen atom. So one, the case which I show you here is one to 50, one argon, 50 hydrogen. So this hydrogen had a five picosecond simulation for each of them. Altogether, we relax for uh, 300 picoseconds. So altogether, the simulation time is 300 plus one plus four. That's how the total simulation time. Similarly, this cycle, this thing we do, 14 argon bombardment we do, one after another. So this forms a set of particles set of simulation. Similarly, uh, such 11 sets were sampled. So one such set of simulation would take typically, uh, let's say one, one and a half to two months of simulation time, because you need to, this potential which we use is a many body pot interaction potential. So it's, it's a bit slow compared to the pair potentials one uses. Uh, as you change the interaction potential, as you include more and more particles, your simulation time goes down. So such that we simulated 11 data sets, which is a little under, uh, I would say, ideally one should simulate at least 30, 35, but it is representative of the result. Now, we also, for comparison, we just did the simulations with argon alone and H alone. Otherwise you cannot say anything whether our models are correct. Now you look at the result, what we results you we get. So what you see on the x-axis is the number of argon, atom, uh, argon atoms increases, number of you start from zero to 14, that is no argon to 14 argon. And you look at the fraction of carbon-carbon coordination. That means how many carbon atoms which are fully coordinated with four other things, four other carbon, so it's from a sp3 hybridization, or how many carbon atoms with three carbon, two carbon, one carbon, and so on. So what you see here is as you, uh, so as you uh, increase the number of carbon atom, your uh, four coordination, which is what you see is in the, or um, lavender color in the bottom, which reduces. That means carbon-carbon bonds are breaking. And you are increasing, on the other hand, the singly coordinated carbon atom, which is rising. You see here the uh, line which is going up, this one. So that means there is surely a bond breaking happen, which you can actually see in the simulation. You can calculate from the coordination number how many carbon atoms coordinated, and you can see what happens to the material. Of course, we also found a very high erosion yield of 1.7 compared to 0.7 in the case of um, reality and experimental yield was a bit low. We will come to that in a second. 
And if you look at a picture of how the surface would look like, this is how the argon alone surface would look like. You see that a carbon atom, which is connected to other one and forming a ring-like pattern here with many carbon atoms and so on. But here you see argon H case, no such structures were observed. None of this is a representative case, but none of the cases we see any such structures. Now, what happens here? So what happened is that when you have argon and hydrogen, argon break the bond and hydrogen atoms sit together sit at the open bond and create some kind of a hydrogen rich layer, which may be chemically bonded, maybe just physically sitting there. In either case, means low potential wells. In either case, there is something called a steric effect, that is the physical effect. So you know that a ethane molecule, if you take the hydrogen atom, the, the hydrogen rotate like this, that is they are not parallel to each other, but they are perpendicular to each other. That is called steric effect. So hydrogen want to maximize their distance between them. So we can see this steric effect plays a critical role. And you can see here that in the case of argon H sample, you have a very high hydrogen to carbon ratio, very high hydrogen content. Whereas in the initial sample, we had very small hydrogen content. So this is something you can actually count and enumerate from the calculation. You can actually quantify them from the calculations. And you look at the erosion yield. That means how many particles leave the surface. So you define that surface is constantly changing. So you define an upper height above which. So in the case of samples here, initially, I just go back here once. Hmm. Here, we have certain height. Above, as you erode the sample, the height keep changing. So you define an upper limit above which a particle flies back. You call it eroded. You can track each particle, its type, size, everything, right? So there is no issue with size in the sense, the energy and everything you can track. So you know um, the erosion yield. And what we see that uh, erosion yield was 1.7 and the way the atoms eroded. So what you also what you can get is how many number of carbon atoms were there in the eroded molecule. So if you look here, if you look for argon and hydrogen, your number of carbon, that means you eroded as long hydrocarbon chain, like six carbon chain, five carbon chain and so on. So that are the kind of information you can get here. Now, if you look at the time scale of simulation, we also see that this all erosion process happened within five picosecond. After four picosecond, we didn't see much erosion. So it's a fast time scale process. And if you look at the kinetic energy of the eroded molecule, you can also get this information from the simulations. You see that uh, they are very high kinetic energy, like 10, 1 to 10 EV. So we bombarded the thermal energy of, it's much more than the bond breaking energy. So that the particles, uh, the uh, we had a room temperature, 300 Kelvin sample, which corresponds to 0 0.025 EV. And the thermal energy, the particle kinetic energy was much higher than 0 0.025 EV. So it is a fast surface erosion mechanism that we could show. So that is what, uh, this was an important point because what we could show that in such complex system with simple tools, one could show the hydrogen uh, argon bombardment create or make the open bones. The hydrogen atom sits here and passivate. You can see that the orange colored hydrogen, which are the newly added hydrogen, which are coming here and sitting and passivate the open bone, which weakens the carbon-carbon network. Earlier, you had a full coordinated CC network. Now you have mostly singly coordinated carbon atoms. And the uh, because of the steric effects, the hydrogen-rich molecular chain, which doesn't let the bone to reconnect. So reattachment of the broken bones is prevented and the molecule is dissolved out. So that's how we show this mechanism in work. So from the MD simulations, you can see from a proper sample preparation and the radiation, you can show that such things can be shown and how you trust your data. Do you really see such training experiment? That is why we varied the argon energy. And what you see here on the top is the erosion yield that you get from experiments. And the one red color is the erosion yield that you see from the simulation. So, so you repeated this for various energies, various sample sizes, temperatures, and so on. Now, you might ask, you might wonder why the MD data is lower than uh, experiments. This is how it should be. Because in reality, you have other processes happening, like diffusion process, which is happening over microsecond to millisecond time scale. This is not something you can simulate in MD, because our total simulation time was few picoseconds. Or at max a nanosecond. So in this case, we will not see anything that is coming from the temperature, uh, the diffusion effect. 
So, uh, however, one can simulate the experiment. So this is one thing also you have to keep in mind that when you simulate an experiment or a real life system, MDA is simulating only part of the problem. You might have actually a multi-scale process where other things also comes into play. So uh, the second part, I wanted to show you an example from neutron effect in material. I think I am really running out of time. So I just show you uh, a quick case where uh, the problem is we have 14 MeV neutrons falling on material target in fusion reactor. And we don't have a 14 MeV source where you can do the experiment. So you kind of rely mostly on the neutron uh, irradiation uh, models and uh, the process is something like this. So what happened is, I just want to give you a quick glimpse that you have a neutron of 14 MeV energy falling on the target. This create something, uh, this can interact with the material atom, let us say a tungsten lattice, so it can interact with the tungsten lattice and create a uh, recoil. So it's like a binary collision problem. You have one particle hitting another particle, creating a recoil. So it's a pure binary collision model you can imagine. And this create a displaced atom, which is what people call as a primary knock-on atom. You see this jargon in the literature. This essentially means it's a recoil atom, which is recoiled by directly by the incident particle. That is why it's called primary. Now, this primary recoil atom create other collisions and what you call a cascade and create uh, the neutron continues to travel in the material, creating several such primary knock-on atoms, several such first strand collisions. And each of these PKA will form a defect in the lattice uh, or a cascade and eventually lead to a defect. So the whole problem is a Monte Carlo molecular dynamics and multi-scale modeling. So this is not something you can only attempt with MD, but MD can give you very in interesting insight. So you look at the PKA energy spectrum, you see that the neutron 14 MeV neutron can have PKAs up to 300 keV in tungsten. This depend on your material. And the critical question is where MD becomes an essential tool is how these secondary collisions happen. That means you create a primary recoil, which has very high kinetic energy, let's say of the order of 150 kilo electron volt. Earlier we were speaking of EV energy. Now you are working on kilo electron volt, three order of magnitude higher. Now, if you look at that, uh, how this slowing down of this PKA happens in the lattice, in a material is a one of the important problems. So there are various ways one can do this problem. And the most direct way is to use molecular dynamics or molecular dynamics is the most appropriate tool for that. So uh, if you look at just the picture here, you can see that the atoms will, um, so here there is a particle which is creating a PKA and then several such collision cascades are happening. And eventually you end up in a uh, system with uh, fewer number of what do you call a defect? Defect means a vacant, you might have heard the terms like vacancies and interstitial. That means an atom is displaced from its position or several atoms are displaced from its position and leaving out some imprint of the cascade in the terms of, in, for the material side, this is a very uh, detrimental aspect from the thermodynamic side. This is a very exciting problem to study various uh, collisional models. And also it's a highly non-equilibrium system. So it's very interesting to study such things. Now, uh, I uh, leave this for because we really have, I leave the slides for you so you can always ask questions in later on. And if you look at the potential, so I just want to add you one particular thing. In the radiation, unlike in the case of a chemical problem where most of the chemical and material science aspects are decided by the bonding region, the potential minima here. So if you want to ask what is the cohesive energy, how much is the Young's modulus, what is the bulk modulus, how much is the thermal expansion, all that is decided by the uh, chemical or all the chemical and material science aspect is decided by the equilibrium part of the potential, which is what you call as the potential minima, or this is the equilibrium distance. We are not doing anything. Uh, this is where all the valence electrons of the material comes into play, or our material properties are decided mostly by the valence electrons. However, the irradiation part where you bombard and displace, it's decided by the repulsive core of the potential. So strengthening of this particular aspect is also an important point in irradiation simulation. There are various ways to do it. There are potentials uh, which are specifically developed to address this point. And this is a very important aspect of the thing. Another thing is the displacement energy. The, the displacement energy means the minimum energy that you need to displace a particle which is also decided by this part. So you need to, uh, one need to look into that more detail when you do the calculations. 
and there are various ways to calculate displacement energy and so on. And one of the important point that you get out of all this is ultimately the question do we want to ask is what is the type of defects that is formed? How many uh, such defects are surviving? And ultimately, what engineers call is a DPA or the material science call people call is a DPA. That means how many atoms in the lattice is displaced. That gives one every kind of a feeling of how the energy is dissipated in the lattice. So there is a number which is called the number of atoms that you incident. So how many neutrons incident and how many lattice atoms are displaced. This is uh, giving you a kind of a knob. It's not really something will tell you how the material behave, but it's like a um, knob or an engineering tool which one wants to calculate. And this is something you see in the radiation literature over, over and of, often again, over and over again. And uh, there is a standard which is basically called NRT standard, which uh, is well known. But if you get to the molecular dynamics problem here, the radiation can be simulated by molecular dynamics. As you know, this is simulated by the, and the steps is basically you need to find out, you start with an initial system, you calculate the force, you advance the time and you see whether you reach the desired physical quantity. If so, you finish the simulations. I just want to show you how a cascade would look like. And then I think I have to, uh, how can I show this? I, I think I have to go, uh -huh. uh, So here, if you look at the picture here, you will see that this is how a cascade would look like. So initially what happens is that you go to the very end where you initialize one PK, one recoil. What you see is a single recoil, which is evolving as a function, which is giving energy, cascading in or giving energy to the lattice atoms, as you see here. And eventually they set this back and leaving out a few defects. So this particular thing, which is called a thermal spike, which is a spike of atoms, is what you call uh, a thermal spike. And if you look in the picture on the right hand side, you see that initially you increase the number of atoms, you dissipate the energy over a large number of atoms. So you start with the 5 k, you dissipate over a large number of atoms. And you Hello? Ha, ah, yes. Ma'am, you have uh, five more minutes. Ah, yeah, I'm, I'm aware of that. And I just want to show you that here you have the uh, uh, vacancies and interstitial. So green and red shows the defects which is formed in the lattice. And you can quantify various dynamics of the cascade. You get various interesting insights from this, like how the cascade is happening, how can you do. But the most important thing is, can you correlate something with reality? So if you look at here, what you see here is a 375 kV cascade. So you have an ion which has a 375 kV energy, which is simulated over roughly 100 million atoms. So the number of atoms from 1,000, now you are exploding to one, 100 million particles. And then you see that the defect structures which are formed. So what you see here is the red and green are the surviving defect at the end of that cascade. So you had a boom of particle, then the settles down, and then finally what you see. And if you look at the size scaling, this is similar to what you see in TEM. So one of the thing we do is to compare the size which you see in TEM, transmission electron microscope, where you can see these little things as the defect. They're of the same size. And we can do very low fluence case which is similar to single particle bombardment. So you can get inside, but not absolute numbers. And there are ways, this is a recent nature communication. So you know that how MD simulations are, it's not from ours, but it's a very popular communication. And you can see that how these calculations become important in material science. And at the last, I uh, want to tell you with this, that it's not that MD alone can give you the overall picture in materials. So if you go yesterday, you heard about details of molecular dynamics and how you get potentials from DFT or electronic structure calculation. And if you really want to go to, um, in this picture you see on the x-axis is the space scale. So you are looking at a few nanometer in a few uh, nanosecond time scale with a few number of atoms, a few million atoms. And ultimately we know that a material one, um, let's say if you take carbon, 12 gram contains Avogadro number of atoms, that is 10 to the power 23 atoms. So that is the scale that you want to simulate. So one important point is all these simulations which are happening at the lower scale, 
As you go to higher, this is called hierarchical multi-scale model, where you increase the scale, you go to the larger and larger space scale, and you larger and larger uh, processes. For example, if you want to simulate diffusion, you cannot use molecular dynamics because uh, conventionally, because it is very uh, fast time scale process in MD and diffusion happens over microsecond. Or if you want to look at the crack propagation or uh, let's say hydrogen diffusion over, or if you want to look at the tensile properties of the material, fracture toughness, they are happening over several uh, cycles, several uh, months of work or maybe years. So those processes, will have to be taken into account the ultimate material property. Therefore, the linking of the scale from MD, how you go to upper scale, like from uh, electronic structure, you derived a potential to came to MD. From MD, you have to take something to go to upper scale. So that is the overall picture of uh, the problem. So MD can do a great role in it, but MD alone cannot support the whole problem. And therefore, it's an active area of research in material science, and especially in high temperature, high energy environment. Thank you very much. I think I exceeded the time a couple of minutes. I'm sorry, but if you have questions, please. Thanks a lot. So it's time for the questions. Uh, if you have any questions, the people online and uh, in here, like in room as well, please ask. Yes. So we have one uh, We have a question. Yeah. Good. Hello. Hello. Could you? Just a second. Just a second. Yeah, I think you'll have to go. Uh, am I audible, ma'am? Now. I I was not. Could you please repeat? Hello. Can you hear me? Ah oh, yes, yes, I can hear me. Uh, you can hear. I can hear you. I can hear me. I can hear you. I think I can also hear me. Let me just stop sharing. Yeah. Ma'am, uh, can you go on a, a slide where you show the algorithm? Uh, MD algorithm. Ah yes, yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, maybe I have to share again. Uh, share screen. This one? Uh, no, with the blocks uh, inside. Ah, uh, so that is the simulation part. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, I have to scroll, scroll back. It might ah, here, right? Uh, yes, 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 ma'am. So uh, here, what you're doing is that from three, 300 Kelvin to 4000, and then again 4000 to 300. You repeat the cycle. Yeah, correct. Uh, 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 so can you elaborate this that why we are doing uh, this? Right. Uh, so, as I said, this is basically, uh, we have taken a collection of random hydrogen and carbon atoms, right? They are not really bonded or they are not in their bonding, binding minima or anything. So, what we want to do is uh, to create an amorphous hydrocarbon sample, which has certain fraction of, uh, let's say, certain hybridized state. And we want to create a sample which is stable. So if you want ideally what you could do if you if it were a lattice let us say then what we could have done is that's what we will show in the uh, tutorial how you relax a lattice you could have taken we are having some numerical problem in uh, numerical uncertainties or let us say numerically maybe not exactly in their potential minimum so we want to relax the sample to a stable state if it were a lattice, we could have set the prescribed positions and then relax them in a, using relaxation algorithms. But here, we have to bond them. So therefore, we want to take them out of their local minima. So the potential profile I showed you earlier, I mean, I drew here. Uh, no interruptions. And maybe I can do a better ink color. So this is your potential profile, right? So ideally, you want the system to be somewhere here. All the particles should be in their potential minima. So carbon, carbon has a potential minima, carbon hydrogen has a potential minima, and so on. But in random collection, the particles may be somewhere here. There could be various local minima which could be created, and the particle might be trapped at any of those positions. So you want to kick them out of this, and this process is something you call a Boltzmannian process. So the 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 uh, so let's say if the microstate, you have large number, you can consider them all of them as a different microstate. So yeah, now you want to uh, empty those states or those potential minimum uh, 
those particles which are in the local potential minima to global minima. So this process goes as e to the power minus e by kt. It's a Boltzmannian process. You, you know. That's why you chose a, a temperature of 4000. Correct. So if you take that your potential minima, you can calculate this. So if you take 4000, you should be able to get rid of almost all the uh, minima of the, or up to 1 EV2 in a reasonable time. Because this goes, this is a time dependent process. You can write the frequency omega goes as some omega naught e to the power e kt. So it depends on the time scale of simulation. Ideally, if you wait infinitely long, you can get everybody back. But you have a physically uh, 50, 60 nanosecond within which you want to do. Therefore, the temperature has to be chosen such a way that uh, within the time scale of this, you invert this, so you get the one hour T, and that is why you want to do. So it's a, it's a process which in a reasonable time you want to do. That is why you went to 4,000. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, ma'am, I have one question. Ah, yeah, sure. Uh, in that process uh, uh, for minimization, so uh, each uh, time uh, you're doing minimization or uh, it was just uh, from 300 to 4,000 and then 4,000 to 300? That is actually a process of minimization. Basically, that is one way to minimize. So if you go for a, as I said, if you create a fixed lattice and then you want to minimize, yes. you do the minimization algorithm slightly yes. differently. Yes, that, 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 is, that is what I'm asking that um, we actually work on a dense plasma. So in that case, we, we take a crystal and then uh, minimize it. So, so how do you minimize you using this? some, uh, what? Uh, method? Uh, some algorithm. Yeah. So yes. how do you do that? What algorithm do you use? Basically the uh, conjugate gradient or fire or something? Yes, 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 yes. conjugate gradient. Yeah, okay. So basically that is taking you to the lowest local, nearest local one. But in our case, uh, this is possible if you have a lattice, where what happens is that the atoms are more or less in their position. You want to relax them a little bit so that they are truly in their local minima. But in the case of a random particle, uh, where they are far from their initial minima, the only way you can do is to really forcefully come to them to the minima after that you can relax it but this process is essential otherwise you are uh, you go to some awkward structure and you won't be really mimicking the system so it depends on uh, how close you start with from the equilibrium position so it's more like you can imagine if you're close to equilibrium position you can give a little push to it but if you're far from equilibrium you really have to take to the equilibrium so that was the process we had to do that was an extreme case. So I showed you that particularly because that's an unusually extreme case. Okay. Okay. Well, that's why I showed, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, one more question. Uh, yeah. What about the ensembles? Uh, this process was done in which ensemble? Huh. So when you do the irradiation, you want to keep in the microcanonical ensemble because you don't want the particle to, uh, let's say you don't want any temperature control there. You want the system to evolve with its own way. So if you lose uh, the, uh, particles you lose if you have the particles in the system you have the, but you don't really do any control of temperature artificially okay. but okay. the problem is that uh, in reality as i said you have to uh, mimic a system as close to reality so what happened is that you might be uh, let's say we have a few nanometer layer or a new nanometer size or in your case probably a few uh, lambda d probably you want to say <laughs> where you have yeah. the processes which are effective but yes. the rest of the system, uh, but you need to have at least a few yes. times of that so that you are not really uh, changing anything. But the far from the system, uh, far from the region of interest, you have a um, bulk system. So if you imagine the irradiation, for example, what happens is that you have an ion which is irradi. Uh, you will see in the simulation live okay. now okay. that it is creating, as I showed you the thermal spike thingy, which is happening. So if I can show that screen again, uh, maybe I can uh, wait. Just give me a second. Uh, PPT. Where was the PPT? Hmm. So what happens that you are uh, you are taking some. We had, uh, for example, in the five kV simulation, something like uh, almost one lakh atoms. Let's say. Oh. But the actual number of atoms participated in the simulation is like 10,000 or so, or maybe even smaller than that. So uh, what we do is close to the edge of the boundary, which is far from any process that might happen, you keep them fixed so that 
the any momentum net momentum transfer simulation cell will not displace from it and you want to keep a temperature control close to that region which is mimicking the uh, this thing so you can do either rescaling of the temperature or some other thermostat whichever way you want to do that depends on the problem you have so uh, basically that was the idea but the center of the system is free to evolve it is not any temperature control or anything it's it's wish to evolve so that's why you need to simulate longer time so that the naturally it goes back to your uh, desired final temperature so you may start with 500 kelvin then you want to reach it 500 kelvin or so on so here you can probably see that a bit more clear uh, yep. so if you start from here you see this whole simulation cell is full of atoms okay so i'm not showing those atoms but there are actually filled but mm -hmm. your region is only this much okay so uh, the simulation cell has to be much larger and you enable a bit of uh, in the case of a bulk system you are in if the system is really really large enough then you don't need any temperature scaling at all because ideally you shouldn't give but for uh, mimicking for a small system we have to do that that was the idea so in these simulations you probably don't need to share yeah uh, no need to share i'm saying no need to do that okay uh, are there any other questions no, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, sure.